Um, so we're oh, all right, morning, everybody. So we're a little bit light on people um, today for our session, which is not a big deal at all. However, there's a couple of things that I wanted to make sure that we took the time to kind of go through talking about the accelerometer kind of in the context of actually thinking about operations as well and kind of how we make certain decisions about the science giving insight into the engineering task, right, and vice versa, right? How is it that the engineering standard might then give way to different science uh, progressions that we might undergo. So one of the things that I'm going to go ahead and share right now real quick into the chat is specifically the instructor notes for um, this week as well as last week. Let me just make sure that the sharing is set up. Let me link. So you guys should be able to view that doc that I just sent out. Um, the big thing here is that the instructor notes, they don't necessarily follow along with anything in the context of a, oh, sorry about that. They don't necessarily follow along in the context of a set of handouts or slides, um, as mentioned last week. Um, the big thing with that is the payload series is really going to be a chance for you guys to send more. So fine, fine tune and tailor to your specific uh, student population. So in that first week looking at communication, right, if you choose to use that as a template uh, moving forward, that'd be fine. Um, but really, I, we want you guys to be able to kind of think about how you are going to engage your students, um, right, in each in your own particular special ways. So um, really what I want to do is kind of talk through what we are doing here at Montgomery High School and then kind of open it up for discussion amongst those of us that are here. And hopefully that would be useful um, for others as they continue to work through what the different um, design aspects might be. Um, so for us here at Montgomery High School, one of the things that we will actually be doing is um, kind of structured around this idea of the accelerometer and knowing that this is the maiden flight for the actual blue shift rocket um, itself, with the Stars Rogue. One of the things that we were really interested in is specifically being able to kind of cater to this idea of creating a vibration profile beyond just going from T0 to some point in time where it leaves a certain amount of atmospheric pressure. So really what we wanted to do is kind of be able to create that gradient um, and see how different accelerometers might be able to collect different ranges of acceleration data, right? And based on the sensitivity of those acceleration values, kind of be able to backwards correlate, if you will, also a, a pressure gradient looking at vibrational data. Um, so obviously that the former part of that is gonna be a little bit of a stretch, but you know, at worst case scenario, right, we will have a vibration profile that looks at this idea of how it is that the rocket is responding to its environment um, and those interactions in particular. One of the things that we would all, we are also looking to fly is besides just an accelerometer that's provided through the um, actual extended core um, that comes as part of the flight hardware is that we'll also be flying a separate accelerometer that we want to be able to kind of fine tune um, through our testing portions, but also be able to take a look at a vibration sensor um, ind independently as well. So what we we're, one of the things that we we're thinking about utilizing is a piezoelectronic vibration sensor um, that would be able to collect kind of analog values and just write to the SD card. And then one of the things that we wanted to do was after the fact, once we receive our payload back, kind of be able to see where it is that those vibration, uh, those vibrations uh, collected in terms of that data might correlate to the uh, data that the accelerometer gives us as well. So the instructor notes, what it kind of goes through is a brief progression as to kind of how you might look at that in the classroom, right? So in the science, really the big thing that I kind of did was, right, the typical looking at dynamics um, and its relation to kinematics, right? So force proportional to acceleration. Um, one of the things that I kind of focus on in that portion is specifically the causal representation, the causal definition versus the operational ones, right? Where students might be more familiar with looking at F equals MA. Um, and then being able to kind of scaffold that in a K to five, as well as a five to 12 type of way. Um, so that's some of the things that we're looking at over at Montgomery High School in terms of utilizing those acceleration values in that way. Um, so really kind of paying more attention to the frequency um, at which the acceleration is changing potentially um, on the rocket and being able to kind of take into consideration that as an entire system object of the rocket, including the engine, things like that 
and its interactions with its environment, specifically being the air, right? So as it's moving through our atmosphere, right? How is it that it undergoes different kinds of, you know, forces and where it is that we see large builds up of where that frequency gets really, really large and where we see that frequency kind of diminish, right? And the changes throughout that period of time. So like I said, I wanted to kind of spend the session as a way for you guys to open up and kind of walk through what it is that some of your students or if you're a student, kind of what it is that your group has been thinking about, how you guys are working through that and whether or not you're going at it from an engineering perspective and then backwards correlating to the science or looking at it in terms of the science and then correlating forward to what it is that you're going to engineer in terms of being able to collect the data needed to be able to run that experiment, right, or test an explanation. So if anyone wants to go ahead and jump in, feel free to do so. I think this would also be a great chance to kind of think about some different ideas as well, potentially. One of the things that will that right now um, in the plan to talk about is also utilizing the light center in terms of different science and engineering activities that we could do there. Um, but one of the things that you guys, hopefully, if you are fully signed in or signed on with the uh, Blue Shift launch is that you should be receiving those extended cores um, within the next week or so as well. So, um, Judy, I see your hand up. If you want to go ahead and feel free to jump in or if anyone else wants to right. go ahead and begin. Daniel, yes, thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering uh, perhaps if I should, if I could share my screen, if you don't mind. I'd like to share the data collected Absolutely. by the, by the um, accelerometer while um, on the International Space Station. So uh, if we have a look here, this is the Kibana dashboard. Um, and what it is, is it's uh, during 2020, we had a kit um, of X chips on the International Space Station for a month. And because it was over the February month thing, that was also exactly four weeks. And um, so this is just, uh, this is the, the data that we collected. We can see here that during those four weeks, the carbon dioxide levels concentration was moving around quite a lot. That was in this particular area that our kit was in on the International Space Station, a very low traffic area, I, I just want to add. Um, and then this is a, the temperature fluctuations, which is really, really interesting. Um, but this is acceler uh, acceleration. Um, and I'd, I'm not sure if you can see, but this, this, data, uh, this data point here on the y-axis is 0 0.049 G. And this one over here is 0 0.053 G. So the thing is that before we flew this kit, Bjarke had actually in his code for this particular IMU or and accelerometer, he had actually said that what he wanted to do is he wanted to measure in the micro G range. Um, so that was actually between zero um, and 0 0.1 G. That's what he'd set his parameters at. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, it's really interesting. So one actually can pick up uh, these micro vibrations, um, but one needs to actually set it up for that. So I thought I found that. So I just wanted to wanted to share that, uh, Daniel. And then, just yeah. before I go, before I go away from the screen, um, what it is is that once a year we do send a kit to the International Space Station with Quest for. Um, with, with Quest for Space. And, um, you know, maybe that is actually something that we, we could consider. You know, Daniel, when you, when you refer to your experiment that, that, you, are, that, that you and your group, uh, your students are looking at at, Mon at Montgomery, you know, the thing is that uh, we, have a, we have a consistent atmosphere on the, on the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. You know, so it could be quite interesting to see what is the comparison between the data that you get when you have one atmosphere and uh, microgravity on ISS versus, versus uh, you know, a hundred kilometer altitude um, atmosphere um, and microgravity or zero G, you know, because the thing is that one of the things that certainly has been detected is, for example, 
um, the carbon dioxide tends to clump, you know, uh, because carbon dioxide itself is a slightly polar molecule. What it does is that on the International Space Station, it coalesces into these kind of clumps. And, you know, I wonder if the density then of that carbon dioxide versus the oxygen nitrogen mix, which is not polar, you know, I wonder if that would make a difference in terms of the medium, you know. So, so I think that you know, what we could do is we could also have a look at how can we collectively, all of us, um, make recommendations for the kit that goes to the International Space Station later this year. Um, yeah. So no, just, just something I, to maybe I, maybe consider, you know, is that a, we have an opportunity to collect a, 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 another data set under very, very controlled circumstances. So it could be quite nice to, to be able to compare things. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to be looking at a relationship specifically from something theoretical, right? So like a drag coefficient through that mixture of gases, right, on a computer simulation versus in real life, right? Because I think being in a being in a real life scenario where we don't have gravity would be really difficult, right? I think we've done the opposite where we've been able to can it, you know, in a vacuum, be able to only have the effect due to the earth. Um, but not the other way around. So I think that would be definitely something. Um, one of the things that I would like to clarify though, Judy, is do you know if the accelerometer that the ARCA flew to the ISS is the same accelerometer that we will be utilizing on the extended core? No, no, it's not the same okay. accelerometer. Um, however, the, the principle remains the same. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's good to know, right? So again, but being in the kind of backwards track way itself, if you did want to fly your own accelerometer, right, that's a great reason to be able to do so is to be able to kind of collectively think about those different ranges. Uh, Rob, um, I see your hand. But, but, sorry, just quickly before we go to yeah. Rob, um, the accelerometer that we fly this year to the International Space Station will be exactly the same accelerometer because it's going to oh, be the extended the, core. between the ISS yes. flights. Yes, yeah, sorry, okay. that, the historical no, yeah. one of 2020, of 2020 is, is, mm -hmm. is different. But going okay. forward, it's going to be, they're all going to be exactly the same. Gotcha. Go ahead, Rob. Well, there we as go. soon as you're ready. <laughs> uh, so to, just to verify that last comment, um, so you had, an accelerometer in 2020, you're not flying that same one again on the ISS the next time, but it'll be the same one we'll have on our suborbital uh, or, or elsewise. Uh, Rob, that's absolutely, you're absolutely correct. Um, okay. Yeah, because unfortunately the one that, that we had then, it was really a great, it was actually the same accelerometer that was on the, the Thinsat program. Um, Unfortunately, it was end of life, so we couldn't get it yeah. anymore. So we had to change that. It may Such actually a be better. Pity. Well, that yeah, may be good too, though, because we'll be comparing if we we can compare our current data on suborbital with uh, with the future ISS launch or uh, release. Yeah. But that's cool. Uh, I actually yeah. put my hand up initially to talk about what you guys know about how accelerometers get calibrated um, in. Because like when we've used them in the high school robotics team, we always had to have the robot sit still for 20, sec 20 or 30 seconds or 10 seconds. I can't remember what it was. Um, I know the power will be on. So uh, from the rocket uh, and as for everything that's always been talked about, the power will be on from very early in the launch, like before the launch, I guess, right? So we can calibrate, we'll be okay. I almost okay. want to say that that might be a Bjarka question, but Judy, do you know? Um, I can ask it. Uh, what I, what what I can what I can do is what all I can say. What I can say is that on the on the twenty second of April we will know. Um, okay. Bianca and I are uh, be spending the twenty first and the twenty second of April with the Blue Shift team. Those two full days. Um, and then we've got so many questions to go through in terms of the launch. So, also, please, this is an appeal. Uh, please, I need questions that you want to ask um, while we have captive engineers. Um, okay. 
Well, along that line, then I'm, along that line, then I'm thinking we'll need to know like what they think the rocket will be doing. You know, because you kind of think, oh yeah, it's sitting there steady, nothing's happening, but maybe there is some vibration, wind, right. other stuff, and to know right. like what does that do to our accelerometer? So absolutely. Cool. Cool. I'm just learning. <laughs> Rob, if you don't mind me asking, is there anything in particular that you and your students have been taking a look at in terms of mission that might not be accelerometer or is accelerometer related that maybe is different from a vibration profile? I know it's it's hard to be outside certain bounds, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, to be honest, as some others have said, we have no students working on this right now. It's uh, two two professors, uh, myself, well, I'm not a professor really, I'm a, I've taught a little bit, but. Uh, so we're, we keep trying to get, we have a satellite team as the semester goes on and they get closer and closer to ends of projects. They're like, yeah, I don't have time. <laughs> so um, we are also trying to get students signed up to do summer. We have TA dollars and stuff that we can spend to actually pay students to do things in the summer and they don't have as much going on. And they're like, oh yeah, we'll be here on campus. We'll do it, you know. Um, uh, that'll be Roy's thing mostly. I've pretty much, he's, he's taken on all that side and I've taken on the technical side, um, but um, so that's that. And then, of course, you probably know, well, I don't know, but Cody in the afternoon will get on me if I don't get this, if I don't get this thing up and running. <laughs> Where's that? There it is. Um, my board. Uh, I just went down this morning. I had one on my desk and then Roy took it back downstairs. We have two kits in the building, but I'm like, Roy, I got to get one of these up here and get it working in my office. Um, so, so we can actually get connected to the amount of dash dashboard and start seeing data and that by, by here in an hour or two. <laughs> um, because I'm behind the curve, <laughs> so yeah. Um, so yeah, so uh, get some data going, and uh, but as far as sensors, uh, I know we may have talked about it in the afternoon calls. Uh, we're definitely looking at doing um, uh, bit flip stuff with data memory chips. I thought maybe we talked about it on this call as well, but uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. that was one of the things we tried to do on ThinSat, but since we didn't power up on the last launch, um, we sure. need to do that. We'd like to do that over again. So probably two or three different chips. One of them hardened, one or two of them not, and then write a lot of data to it and read it out constantly and see if any of it changes because of gamma particle bombardment. Um, yeah. You do some of that test here on the ground, but of course, because uh, I mean, you start reading about it, even supercomputers here on the ground do redundant software systems and things. As right. I read more, as we, we kind of thought this idea up and then we thought, well, let's go do some research. And as we did more research for it, wow, I mean, super, even supercomputers, you know, um, the Cray and other stuff, they do all these things to deal with this, this bombardment issue that we didn't even know about until we started doing research about a year ago or something. So we'd like to know, this came up for us a year or two ago or three years ago, using Arduinos and parallax processors and stuff. We just wanted to know if there's going to be data corruption in space, whether we have to use hardened chips and stuff like that. So that's why we keep kind of driving down this path on our side. And of course, we didn't get the data because we didn't turn on the thin set launch. So right no that's awesome i i think that that would definitely have a lot of implications especially for you know as we continue to try to do more and more with with the um with the sensor chips that come out from uh, max iq right what is it when we say that something is space ready versus not space ready right and yeah. looking at yeah. materials engineering perspective mm -hmm. um it's actually interesting that you say that i don't want to go too far into potentially thinking about our future science and engineering payload session. But, you know, one of the things that, that I kind of set up as a pathway for looking at the light sensor is this idea of using UV, right? With the photo photoelectric effect, right? So, you know, how much energy is it that we really get, right? From UVA, UVB, right? And as soon as you're outside of the atmosphere of earth, right? Then now UVC plays a much bigger role as well. Yeah. You know, we're talking very, very, very large amounts of energy, right? Um, and with that, with, you know, creating current and you know you have pretty much essentially if you will you know corrosion of materials kind of almost like rust on iron but due specifically to the bombardment of you know all of these photons that have these really really high energies um not even taking into consideration all the cosmic ray stuff too yeah. so i think uh, i i definitely think that there's that kind of correlation and looking that way is really interesting in context of data um from some of the students, right? What are what is it that you guys in your pairs or groups or schools might be doing in terms of actual payload, right? So are you going with the standard payload that's being provided from Max IQ? Are you guys thinking about 
you know, potentially doing your own payloads? And if so, you know, what's kind of the basis of how you guys are making those decisions? Are you going from science to then thinking about what the engineering is, or are you taking it more so from the perspective of, you know, here's a really cool sensor that can collect some kind of data. What's the science that we can do with it? So Manuel, Megan, Grace, feel free to jump in. All right. Uh, so yeah. Um, so yeah, so actually tomorrow I'm going to actually be able to look at the kits for the first time. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to set up it and so on good. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we, I am planning to put um, three um, IMUs on it, on, on board, uh, along with the one that comes with the kit. Um, I'll be using a standard one, a very, very common one in robotics, uh, MPU 6050, uh, MPU 9250, and uh, GY85 um, IMU. So those three together, they should give me a, a nice range of... Um, of acceleration and gyroscopic data. So hopefully, you know, we'll be able to work work it out and see how it could all fit together within the space constraint. And also so, another thing is yeah, sales gonna ask you no, guys. No. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Um the would you guys provide like a card drawing of the layout of the, the trio um CubeSat that will be fitting our stuff in? Or, or so circuits? It wouldn't, a, it wouldn't be a cube set, it would be a flat set. But Judy, do you want to go into yeah. that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, what we're going to be doing is that all of these slices are going to be uh, integrated into uh, 3U stacks. Um, and yes, that is one of the, the, that is one of the, the things that we need to bed down with Blue Shift Aerospace is uh, in terms of the, the payload integration manual. Uh, we have to get that finalized. So that is going to include um, the, the drawings and the specifications of the, the 3U that we need to, as Max IQ, need to provide to, uh, to Blue Shift. Um, and then also exactly, you know, where, how those, uh, how these slices are being uh, slotted into that. Um, and while we are on that, uh, we're going to need to have a, a session at some stage where we work out who, whose slice sits where, um, depending on the payload and depending on what data you want to collect. Um, because that's going to be absolutely crucial because you need to know exactly where you are in that payload, but especially when it comes to something like the accelerometer. Um, you definitely want to know your, 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 your three-dimensional uh, position there. So yes, that is going to come. So we can expect that uh, early May. Absolutely. Yeah, another thing too. Um, well, I know the, the the development board, the part of board that you guys designed, it was designed so that the main model, the main chip is going to be like off centered. Um, so and then the the, the development board is going to be on the other side. So I want to know if if there will be any problems with like you know in takeoff, if it's going to be like a lever action and just like flex the boards, or if it's strong enough to hold up um, to the strain yeah that's okay from a mechanical design perspective yeah that is that is a really crucial part of this is to make sure that our mechanical design is really really robust so um, we're going to make absolutely sure that we don't have anything like lever actions or whatever it is uh, it's going to be a it's going to be an aluminium 3u frame that everything is is connected to so yeah we're going to have to we're going to have uh a mechanism to to connect all the all four points you know to to the frame so yeah um I'll, please don't concern yourself with with aspects like that because i don't think that is actually going to be an issue because we're gonna we have to make sure that mechanically it's a very 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 sound design and of course we're going to be testing this beforehand are we but going to put everything through their motions there's absolutely no way then we're going to go for this launch without everything being thoroughly tested again and again and again under extreme circumstances. Great. All right. Yeah. That's just something okay. I wanted. No, absolutely. Thank you. So, Emmanuel, I do have some follow-up questions for you, though. Have you started yeah. testing with these IMUs that you're thinking about flying? Uh, personally, I've used, um, in, in previous robotics um, design, I've used the MPU 6050, but however, there are flyers and so on, and even if there aren't libraries, I could make my own libraries for them. So it that's not really an issue that I would um 
really look through. so in terms of coding and testing and so on it should be straightforward it should should be hopefully it is <laughs> i mean most of the times these things aren't but uh hopefully it's going to be straightforward yeah i was thinking more so in terms of the mechanical testing actually for those sensors right so actually going through the process of you know putting it on a shake table right and being able to see you know what is it capable of handling right and then thinking about it against the theoretical data set that you know, Blue Shift provides for what it is that they believe is going to be happening. Um, I would say considering those limitations, right, and actually getting that data and gathering that data and then having it be against it so that you know roughly what to expect would be a good way to kind of set up if you're, if you're going to go down that path of, you know, your mission flying is explicitly going to be for collecting that kind of data. Um, yeah, well, definitely we're going to have to build a shake table, actually, because we don't, I don't think we have one. I got to check the campus okay. to see if they have one, but I, I, I don't think they would have one. <laughs> so we got to build, um, do yeah. some improvisation and build uh, it. With the uh, civil engineering department, right? Or the uh, environmental engineering department. Yeah, I got I got to check them out and see. So again, for others, right? So Megan, Grace, or I see Jim's joined us as well. Um, in terms of your missions for payload, right? If you're not necessarily looking at, or if you're not necessarily concerned with the acceleration data, right? In the context of vibration profile, you know, what are some of the ideas that you guys are thinking of, right? Whether it be that as a student, you are thinking of something, um, or if you have a group of students that you're working with. Yeah, Megan, go ahead. Hi, so I am working in a group but we, we haven't really, um, you know, like last week I joined the call as well, this call, and we, we threw some ideas around me and Declan, we threw some ideas around, but our the rest of our group haven't gotten together specifically to think of ideas. Um, but yeah, other than that, I'm just playing around with my kids and seeing what it can do to familiar, familiarize myself with the kit as well. Sure. What kind of ideas have you and Declan kind of thrown around, if you don't mind me asking? Um, so last week we spoke about, well, I spoke about using um, the kit to maybe cal uh, calculate what frequencies you could listen to music at. Maybe uh, Judy mentioned something about pressure as well. I don't know. It was just an idea that we were discussing last week. Okay. That's actually really interesting. So one of the things that actually over at Montgomery High School that we are looking at um, really more so for, for after the suborbital missions when we uh, start thinking about the orbital missions through Blue Shift um, is actually one of my students came up with the process of being able to backwards correlate pressure based upon atmosphere, uh, based upon uh, sound, right? So using sound as a, as a tertiary measurement for being able to you know, propagate what a pressure uh, profile might look like, what that density looks like, utilizing the idea that right, sound needs some kind of medium to be able to propagate and travel. So if that's the case, right, as the air is changing, right, if you have some fixed frequency right, at some fixed level and you know the distance between the source and the receive of that sound, right, then one of the things that you should be able to do is be able to see as the change right, in whatever the receiver picks up, or in this case, the microphone, Right, then you should be able to kind of correlate that to, to say that it's proportional to some kind of pressure profile too. So I think one of the things that'd be really interesting is, you know, if you could somehow be able to slap on something kind of on the outside, right, be able to see that change in that way and be able to kind of correlate that as a graph. Yeah, definitely. Um, Grace or Jim, I see something came through the chat, but um, if you guys want to go ahead and, you know, throw out any ideas that maybe you guys are thinking about in terms of what it is that you want to collect for data, right? Or in terms of how you are going about utilizing the sensors that are on the actual uh, STEM kit that it comes with, right? What are you guys thinking? So Jim, I see that you said in the chat that you guys haven't landed on anything. What kind of discussions have you guys had so far? Or Grace, if you want to jump in with any of the things that you've kind of thought about. So right now I'm still familiarizing myself with the kids, just working around with it. I'm using the Kibana app as well, seeing how it works. 
Okay. Had a little bit of trouble hearing you, but um, I think one of the things that I said, it, I think one of the things that I heard is that you're getting used to the Kibana dashboard. Is that correct? Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Awesome. So one of the things that's kind of great about the Kibana dashboard is that it allows certain visualizations, right, based upon a particular data set. So once you've kind of identified your satellite in the, um, in kind of the beginning portions before you get to the visualization step, then one of the nice things is that it'll constantly update through your particular satellite. One of the things that you just need to make sure that you do is that when you select one of the actual um, things that you go ahead and make sure that you've actually clicked add for your particular satellite. So I know one, I know when we were flying all of our CubeSat kits um, using the XK07, one of the things that we didn't do is explicitly select our particular ground station ID. And as a result, we got the cumulative data of all the other people who are flying XK07s that day through the MQTT server. Um, so that was kind of one of those technical hurdles that we had to sort through all the data to be able to see who's, whose pressure data was whose, right? And whether or not the relationships that we were getting were consistent with what we wanted to be able to get, to be able to state what the altitude was of the actual satellite itself. Um, so kind of as you guys are familiarizing yourselves with those things, right? One of the things that I would say that would probably be really interesting is once the extended course come, right? Now being able to actually get that acceleration data, right? And be able to populate that acceleration data through to, get up to, to, through to Kibana as well. I know one of the things in particular that um, our group at Montgomery High School would be doing um, as well is specifically the idea of looking at whether or not the, free, the rate at which the data is being sent to the Kibana dashboard um, is high enough, right? Or if we can look at it in a great enough detail to be able to see those frequency changes as well. So I think that's gonna be one of the primary limitations, if you will. Um, and more so the fact that, you know, because we are also recording to an SD card, right? That we should be able to get a little bit better resolution for what actually is stored hard. Um, stored on the hardwire. So when we do populate back into the uh, dashboard after we get our payloads back, hopefully we'll get a little bit more um, of that information in between. Um, for those of you guys that are not familiar with the Kibana dashboard, um, hopefully you guys have started to think about getting familiar. I know Rob shared that he would be doing so in the next couple of hours. Um, I think once you kind of have your dashboard up and play around with the time set settings and things like that, and being able to figure out how often you want to be able to show data points being collected, um, it'll give you a little bit more, uh, give you a little bit more of a clarification on how you want to think about collecting that data and based on how it's going to then be represented. Um, there's a whole bunch of visualizations as well that are included. Um, for me personally, I've only really utilized a couple of them. I haven't gone through all of them as I, either, but um, you know, if you haven't done so, I do highly suggest that you think about all those different representations, mainly because a lot of times, right, the cross representations of utilizing more than one um, representation simultaneously is kind of how you can think about potentially different missions using the same sensor. So I think that's really kind of one of the things that we'll, we'll save to go further into detail during the operations um, sessions, which would be the next uh, set of notes coming out. But it's 9.51 right now, so I do just wanna be conscious of everyone's time. I know for myself that I don't have too much time here, um, but one of the last things that I kind of wanted to say is as we kind of move forward into the second portion of our payloads now, right? Today's conversation, thinking about those engineering aspects of, you know, how do you decide, right, what range to collect accelerations for, right? And then, you know, based on those ranges that you collected, right, are you going to actually be able to see the frequency at which the acceleration changes, right? And then being able to actually test that to know whether or not the resolution is going to be high enough for you to actually see them. Um, one of the things for our second payload science and our second payload engineering, as I mentioned earlier, um, for those guys who were on the call, is looking at it in the context of light, right? So specifically not lux, but more so UV. Um, so the science is going to go in and talk about a little bit of the photoelectric effect, right? And why UV light, right? And, and the shorter wavelengths of light are kind of interesting and valuable to us to think about, especially in the context of space. Um, and then the engineering session will be thinking about specifically what the effects of those things might be to test 
to see if this change in UV index, right, or the change in UV and UVB um, quantity, right, would then be able to make you, uh, would then allow you to be able to make certain statements about materials that you choose, things like that. Um, so one of the things that I'm going to go ahead and let Judy talk briefly about is kind of what is to come. Um, the next couple of weeks will be in a little bit of a flux, mainly because high schools in general are kind of going through that process of going from spring break and being in school and not in school um, with those sessions. And then also kind of what we might be able to expect with those extended cores as they begin to arrive and things like that. So go ahead, Judy. Absolutely. Uh, Daniel, thank you very much. So yeah, um, Cody's not on the call right now. It's probably because he's uh, uh, furiously packing packages. Uh, so he, uh, between uh, Friday last week and day before yesterday, he received uh, the, the flight hardware kits. So he's, he's uh, sending those out to everybody uh, in the US and I'm sending them to everybody else in the world. Um, and so, yeah, we're all gonna be receiving our kits uh, definitely within this next week. Um, so we can start working with those. Um, yeah, so what I'd like to do is, I just, wanted, I just wanna share some photographs quickly that we can look at, so we can maybe just get a few ideas. Uh, this is something that uh, Bjarke 3D printed a little frame that he put a tiny little mirror in. So you can see here, bottom left-hand side, he 3D printed this little um, uh, holder over here for a mirror, uh, which actually screws into the, uh, into the board itself the, of the light sensor. And here, top in the middle, this is actually the reflection um, that we can see in the mirror of the light sensor. So that means that even though you have a, a slice, uh, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to 3D print this little mirror holder and, uh, and actually uh, have that angle so that you can actually um, uh, reflect, uh, you can, you can uh, receive the, those rays. So, so yeah, and here it is uh, with the extended core, you can see how it kind of fits onto the kit and it'll definitely fit into the, the height uh, allocation that we have for everybody um, in, in terms of their payloads. So that, that's, that's one of the things that we can consider if you have 3D printers, uh, Bjarke's definitely, I think he's, he, he may already have shared the file um, on Discord or otherwise he's going to do so very, very soon uh, so that you can start working on that. Um, yeah, so for the next few weeks, um, next week we will, we will definitely, we'll be able to have a session next week. Um, I think what I'm going to do is uh, send out kind of an appeal of how many people are we going to have attending next week or should we maybe postpone it uh, slightly? Uh, the week after that, uh, which is the, the ninth, the, Daniel, uh, it's the sixth today, six plus 14, the, the 20th, the, um, yep, yeah, 20th. the, the, tw the 20th um, is gonna be really, really difficult for all of us. So we're probably gonna skip the, uh, a session on the 20th. And then the following week on the 27th, um, uh, most of us in Max IQ space are actually going to be at the CubeSat developers workshop. So what we'll do is we'll have something very, very informal where, where we'll come to you live from the, from the CubeSat developers workshop. And then we'll be, be back to normal uh, the week after that. Um, we are we setting up a, a number of uh, industry uh, presenters for you. And uh, yesterday, I actually had a fantastic conversation with Mike Miller from Stirk Industries. They, they do a lot of the paperwork and licensing for a lot of um, uh, education uh, CubeSats and, and satellite missions. And he, he mentioned to me that they've actually got some lunar emissions that they, they're actually having processed at the moment. So he's going to be doing a session for us on um, what to consider when when uh, designing our payload for our CubeSats eventually, not only to consider it for this particular launch, um, for a suborbital launch, but when you're going to orbit, um, just to be very aware of what is gonna be allowed and what's not gonna be allowed so that you don't go all the way down this development path and then find that you can't get a license for it. You know, beginning with the end in mind. 
Um, so that's going to be a really terrific uh, session that, that Mike is going to be uh, delivering for us as well. Um, on Star Wars Day, May the 4th, uh, be with us. Um, we are having the session with the, the Blue Shift Aerospace Engineers. So that's really going to be also very, very interesting. So um, have your questions ready. Um, good, Daniel, uh, thank you. I think that's really it from me. Um, thank you very much for those uh, educator notes. Um, I'm finding it really, really interesting. I'm learning so much. Thank you. I didn't know that this uh, old dog could learn such new tricks, but uh, yeah. And Rob has his hand up. Are you meeting with uh, Blue Shift or are they going to be on this call? I didn't catch which way that was. Um, we are meeting with Blue Shift for two days on the on the 21st and 22nd of April. That and then Max, they, Max, they Max, are joining Max. us on in this Zoom session on the oh, okay. on 4th okay. of May. Yeah, okay. as well. Thanks. As well, yeah. Yeah, that's about all I have as well. So hopefully, as you guys are starting to go through that process of making decisions about what you want to actually collect data for, what you actually care about um, being able to see in terms of your missions, right? Hopefully, these payload sessions are giving you ideas. Um, again, they're not necessarily meant to be one to one, right? So we're not necessarily saying that you have to do, you know, vibration profile testing, or you have to do anything with the light sensor but more so being able to kind of extrapolate those ideas and say, you know, if these are things that we can do with these sensors, what else could we do with potentially other sensors as well? Um, I know one of the things that maybe next week we were thinking about as well is potentially foregoing the light sensor to talk through the extended core as many of us will be receiving them by then as well. And to start thinking about potentially if you are going to go that custom route, how it is that you might get started, things like that. But um, that's up to Judy to determine and let us know. So that's, uh, yeah, so like I said, that's about all I have. Um, if any of you guys have questions as always, right, the Discord's the best way to go. Um, I'll be on there, Cody will be on there, um, Yerka's on there as well. So feel free to ask. Um, we'd love to know kind of how you guys are working through those missions um, that you are developing and what kind of roadblocks you come across, right, and how you guys are all troubleshooting through them. Um, I, a lot of that information would be super helpful, I think, for everyone else as well. Great. Daniel, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks.